We are back after a long break, Baruch Hashem. We had a lot of things to take care of, a lot of you know, uh, stories to tell in Eretz HaKodesh, but we're back. We're going to continue learning the Chatzar Yosef, Bezat Hashem. We left off several months ago in the middle of the story of Titus, in the, in the, which is uh, in the Masechet Gitin, which actually the Dafyomi cycle passed over these stories recently, a few weeks ago, um, and also coincided right, right with the Sheba of time which is when it's really applicable. Nevertheless, I have to just bring you back to speed where we are in the story and what we're going to talk about now. So Titus, Titus Arasha, the Roman general who eventually became the Roman king, as we'll see over here. He, became the, uh, he succeeded his father Vespasian. He destroyed the second temple, says the Gemara Masech Gitin. He did terrible things in the Holy of Holies. We, saw, we learned about how he brought a harlot over there, he spread a Sefer Torah on the floor, did a terrible sin with her right there, and then he stabbed the parochit, he stabbed the, the beautiful and expensive and precious curtain that separated from the Holy of Holies to the main sanctuary, um, and then bled, the curtain actually bled. We went into that, what that means, the depth of that, um, in parts, in sections one, two, and three. We actually skipped section two, because uh, it was a short sort of side point section. We did one and three. Of this chapter. Now in t- uh, chapter 10, section 4. Titus is back in Rome. The Jews are enslaved, of course. There's no temple anymore. And what happened, what, the last thing we said was Titus was, was coming back on uh, the ocean, on, on a boat, back to Rome. And a big swell came. Not a swell, but a storm came. And he understood that God was bringing that storm. The God of the Jews was bringing that storm to him. And he started mocking God. He said, oh, this God of the Jews only has powers in water. When Paro, Paro came along in Egypt, he swept them away in the Yam Suf. When Sisera came along, which is a story in the, in the book of Judges and Shoftim, he was swept away by the, by the Kishon Brook, which is also a body of water. He can't do anything else. Fight me on dry land. He said that to God. And God said, yeah, you know what, fine. And he calmed the waters down. He came to dry land. And what did God send up his nose? A mosquito. A little mosquito, he died. and that mosquito etched away at his brain for many years. For years and years and years, and now we're in the middle of that story. What happened with that mosquito? Okay, says the Gemara, page 138. Yomachad, uh, sorry, I'll, just, I'll go straight to the English. One day, Titus was ba- passing by the gate of a blacksmith's shop in Rome. When it, shama, which means heard, the sound of the hammer, it silenced. What that it is, we're going to have to discuss later on. But right now, I'll keep it simple. It could either mean, uh, you know, the, the gnat, the mosquito that was in his head, or it could be Titus. Titus said, there is a remedy for my suffering, which means whenever he heard that banging of the blacksmith, the mosquito stopped, the mosquito stopped bothering him in his head, in his nose, up in his brain. He only got it in his brain. He wasn't already in the nose. He, he yeah, it was not in the brain, yes. Every day, when they would bring a blacksmith, I'm sorry. Every day they would bring a blacksmith, and they uh, hammered before him. This was his remedy. They had to call a blacksmith to constantly be banging all day in front of him. For Gentile blacksmiths, he Titus would give four zuzim, which is a decent payment of gold, as payment. But to a Jewish blacksmith, if they happen to have to call a Jewish blacksmith to run the shift that day, he would just say to him. It is enough for you that you see your enemy in such pain. I don't have to pay you anything. He did this for 30 days. From that point on, forward, says the Gemara, Kevan de dash dash. That's the list of Lashon. Translation, once it threshed, it threshed. Kevan de dash. Dash means to thresh. It means to like, it means to thresh literally. It's one of the steps of making bread. It's uh, to thresh the wheat out of the chaff, out of the uh, you know, uh, natural encasing of it. But in Hebrew, there's a uh, you know, expression to the dash, thresh means to like, once you don't care about something anymore, you, you, you step on it with your heels. Like famously in the very beginning of Parashat Ekev, Rashi explains over there, what does it mean Ekev? Ekev means because you listen to my, to my mitzvot, X, Y, Z. But Ekev also means the heel. And what does that mean? So Rashi is trying to uh, explain it over there. That if you listen to the mitzvot that most people trod upon with their heels, dash, the same language he uses, those that, those that people don't pay attention to, then you will get the ex- super extra reward. So that's the, the, it's used in a connotation of I don't care anymore. 
Rashi says over here now in our Gemara, it's silence. So what does it mean, silence? This refers to the gnat. So Rashi says it's talk, we're talking about the actual mosquito with silence. And once they heard the hammer banging, it would stop picking at his brain because of the sound. Good. The Maharal actually says it's Titus. Because our, our Gemara says Shema, it heard. Or it can also mean he heard. It's just a general third person heard. So Rashi says it's talking about the gnat, the mosquito heard. But the Maharal says, we'll see later on, it's talking about Titus heard. We'll see if that makes a difference. Next thing Rashi says, once it de- it rushed, it rushed, dash, dash. once the mosquito became accustomed and learned the sound of the hammer, it recognized it and would no longer stop picking at his brain. Which means that even the mosquito, after 30 days, got used to the sound of the banging of the hammer and never and it was no longer bothered. The mosquitoes here? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I, I, I do think, I believe so, yeah. They have some sort of hearing apparatus. They respond to sound waves, yeah. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, double check me on that, but I don't see why not. It says further over here, Shah Now we're going to ask our questions over here. The qu- yeah, a gnat. It's different than a mosquito? Or it's the same thing? It's different. It resembles, but it's different. There's binding and non binding. Yeah, so basically the, uh, the word in Hebrew is yatush. And it's a fly. It, no, a fly is a zvuv. So yatush can mean either one. Yeah. Same fa- similar cousins. Okay. Shara Chatzir, questions that we have now. Of all the sounds in the world, why was it specifically the sound of a banging of a hammer that momentarily relieved Titus of his suffering? Question number one. Question number two. Why does it matter how much Titus paid the Gentile blacksmiths? Why does the Gemara tell us he paid him for Zuzim? Big deal. Right? Why did the Gemara take a measure to mention that he would pay them exactly for Zuzim instead of simply stating he paid the Gentile blacksmiths while for the Jewish blacksmiths he gave nothing? Why do you have to give me a number, a dollar amount, so to speak? Why do I care? Next question. Surely as the emperor of Rome... Titus's resources were exorbitant. You like that word, don't you? As such, I always say it to him because he always teaches me new words every day. I forgot the other word he told me. Uh, scans recently. Okay. As such, why would they bring him Jewish blacksmiths at all? I don't understand. They had to bring a Jewish blacksmith? There's thousands of uh, Roman blacksmiths lining up to serve their emperor. Why do you have to get a Jewish guy? get anybody. He didn't have to be a blacksmith. Just anybody who can make that noise. He's not making anything. He's just making noise. I guess he wanted someone who really who had the expertise in how to properly create the banging sound that, 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 that gave him the remedy that he needed. So Titus was clearly troubled by the fact that he needed a Jew to provide relief for his suffering, right? Which is evident by the fact that he didn't want to pay him. So why bring Jews black, Jewish blacksmiths at all? Were there not enough Jew- Goy blacksmiths? And the last question here, what is the meaning of the peculiar phrase uh, at our Gemara, at the end of our Gemara, where it says, Kevan de dash dash, once it threshed, it threshed. Rashi explained that it's a figure of speech, referring to how the mosquito or the gnat became accustomed to the sound. But is there a deeper layer of meaning beneath the surface? Must be, no? Why did the remedy only work for 30 days? Also, what is it about the 30 day time period? that creates a sort of sense of getting used to. Okay, now we're going to jump to the Amudin HaChatzer. It's pretty short. It's, pretty, it's good. I like this, this piece. It's nice and to the point. And uh, we might even finish the whole thing today if we have good patience. Amudin HaChatzer, a few commentaries. Says the Maharsha. The Gemara quoted Tehillim 74.4. Uh, which Gemara is he talking about? He's talking about all the way in section 1 of this very chapter. Um... And it referred to Titus. What was that verse again? Let me just check here quickly. All the way back in section 1. Tehillim 74.4. It said, Your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. Right? That's referring to Titus as being the enemy of God. And he came to the meeting place, which is the Holy of Holies. And he set his own signs for signs. Which means once he saw the blood trickling down from the curtain, he said, Oh, their God is defeated. That's how he understood it. And then we went to a whole, a very 
an important lecture, section one of the chapter. You should watch it. But anyway, back over here. So Maharashtra continues on page 139. Uh, and it seems that the next verse after that, that follows that verse in Tehillim, is also about Titus, the Maharashtra wants to say. He does that a lot. Whenever he finds a verse that the Gemara quotes about something, he says, oh, go to one verse behind. Go one verse after. And he shows you, he expands how it's actually talking exactly what the Gemara is talking about. So he goes to the next verse and it says the following. It had been regarded as bringing above the axes in the thicket of trees. Right? The is very poetic. Bringing above. Applying this verse to Titus, it means that Titus tried to regard himself as glorious by bringing back the parochet as a trophy, right? Trying to thrust his honor above. Or as bringing above, that the term as bringing above in that verse 74.5 in Tehillim could mean that he thought he killed himself, which means he thought he killed the one that cannot be killed as we explained before. Also, just as the axe picks the wood, of the tree in this verse, where you use the axe to pick at wood, so too the gnat, the mosquito, picked at his brains. So all these concepts in this verse apply to him. The next verse in Tehidim, so I guess that's going to be 74.6, also talks about Titus, as it says, and now all its ornaments together, referring to all the nations, Gentile and Jewish alike, they beat down their hammer and chisels. The verse actually says that. So you see how it's referring to Titus. Referring to the hammer blows that they performed before Titus in order to ease his pain. Okay, nice insight there by the Maharaj. Maharal. Now he comes and says, Maharal. Regarding the hammer, the principle is that one distraction nullifies the other. So when Titus would hear the banging of the hammer, it would momentarily nullify the distraction of the mosquito slash gnat picking at his brain. So according to the Maharal, the mosquito never stopped when it heard the hammer. It's just that Titus was distracted. According to Rashi, the mosquito would stop. The mosquito was distracted. That's the difference between Rashi and Maharal over here. Okay. This only worked for 30 days, since after 30 days, the sound of the hammer is no longer something different. Rather, he became accustomed to hearing it, and it could no longer serve as a, as a distraction from the gnat. And so the gnat's picking was noticeable again. A little, little problem with this maharal, if you're telling me that the, he, he became accustomed to the stimulus of the hammer after 30 days, why didn't he become accustomed to the gnat after 30 days? Because that's painful. Chronic pain is different. Why? When... He's doing this to his brain. The brain is sending sending signals to the nerve endings. Yeah. This is a different kind of thing. Uh -huh. You know. But so is the sound. The sound is also sending signals. Sound. But you're saying we, it's a different we, we type. Get, we, yeah, we get used to sounds. Even loud sounds, they don't bother. You're right. I used to sleep with my brother playing drums. Right. Yeah. He's playing there. I'm in, I'm in bed here. Yeah, right. That's called desensitization. Yeah, that's, exactly that's a right. neurological term. Once you get exposed to something a lot, you get desensitized to it. You don't feel it as much, when especially you sounds. Nerves. Nerve endings, you, you could cut off a right. limb, and they, they, even though you don't have that limb anymore, you feel like it, it's hurting you at the tip of that. Right. So if I was going to be a little scientific, I would add to what you're saying, and I would say something called noxious stimulus. Noxious stimulus means any unpleasant feeling. Pain, for example, right? So that... So, uh, so, so when the pain receptors are being constantly hit, you can't desensitize that. And on, on the contrary, the brain wants you to know there's something wrong, and so it's not going to desensitize it. it. If anything, it might increase it, something called allodynia. Allodynia is when the certain nerve endings, because of something that happened there, are much more sensitive than usual. A famous example they always tell us in school, told us in school, was a sunburn, right? When you do this, you have nerves, and then it doesn't hurt, but you feel the rubbing, you feel the pressure, but oh, if that skin is sunburnt, even the slightest touch is the, you know the feeling of the sunburnt touch. It's painful. That's called allodynia. Anyway, going further over here, Ben Yehoyada, which is the Ben Ishchai, he has two books on the, on the uh, stories of the Gemara, Ben Yehoyada and Ben Yahu, and in both of them he has commentary on this piece. So first we're going to talk about Ben Yehoyada. Titus finding restitution. You like that word too, don't you? You know what that means, right? Mr. Mavashev, what's restitution? Payback. 
Restitution? No, that, restitution. that's retribution. No, different kind of payback. Restitution means solace. No. Yes. No. Restitution, restitution <laughs> is, let's say you go to war. It's not uh, like beat, beat you up and that, that's retribution. Yeah. Restitution is when you make good on something that you owe. That's restitution. Can you find the definition of restitution? Because now you're making me second guess if I should have used that word here or not. By the time we do that, I'll keep reading. Titus finds restitution, which I'm trying to mean, I'm trying to say uh, peace, so to speak, so to speak. In the hammer banging. Okay, here's the definition of restitution. The act of restoring to the rightful owner something that had been taken away, lost, or surrendered. The act of making good or compensating for loss, damage, or injury. So I used it right. Yeah. Right? Compensation, meaning the replacing of the, of the, of the pain. Yeah, so I used it right. To return or to, to a restoration of a previous state of position. Okay, so I'm all good. I know English. Okay. He found restitution in the hammer banging. Uh, this was ordained by heaven as a punishment for him since it necessitated the Romans to bring Jewish blacksmiths in addition to the Gentile blacksmiths to create more hammer banging sounds. Meaning the fact that he had to bring a Jew to, do, to bang the hammer for him, that was like a, that was, that hurt him. That was like a twist of the knife in him from heaven upon him. The fact that Titus needed Jewish assistance pained him, which means bothered him, even more than just the physical pain caused by the gnat alone. Why? Uh, pain means pain. You should have used pain. Pain? Yeah. That would have been better. Simpler. Okay, fine. It's not simpler. It's just they sound the same. No. No? Next, Benayahu says the Ben in another book. Titus arranged for Jewish blacksmiths to bang the hammer before him so that Jews would gain pleasure in seeing their enemy in so much suffering. Ah, so what's his calculation here? Uh, well, uh, is he trying to make us feel better? You know, he thought is that... He, is he, he actually apologizing to us? I wouldn't say so. Look, he, he did so in the hopes that this would be reason enough for salvation from his suffering. Meaning... Oh, you let, mean so Hashem would feel Yes, sorry, he's saying, I know that Hashem brought this upon me. Let me so suffer in front of Hashem's people. No. So in order that maybe Hashem will take this away. There's only one way. To say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and you are the greatest. He didn't say that. He wanted to do it this way. It doesn't work. Yeah. Sometimes it's harder to say things. It's easier to show them. Anyway, as it says, When your foe falls, be not glad. And when he stumbles, let your heart not be joyous. Lest Hashem see it, see it be displeasing in his eyes. And it be. See it, and it be uh, displeasing in his eyes. And he, and he turned his anger away from him. That's a verse in Mishle, right? So uh, note 4 on the bottom says, Titus' hope was that when the, Jew, when the Jewish blacksmiths rejoiced over Titus' suffering, Hashem would remove his suffering, Titus' suffering, and turn away from the Jews, a principle derived from his verse. Right, so basically the, this verse says over here, in, in this verse in Mishle says, when you look at someone and you rejoice in their suffering, be careful, because it's going to turn around, on, God might turn around on you next. Right? So same thing here. He wanted to have a Jew to look at him suffering so that Hashem would say, hey, be careful, I'm going to look at you Jews next. Are you telling me Titus knew Jewish law? Sort of like a reflecting of the... Uh, to tell Titus was so erudite and he knew Jewish law. He you know, knew it's... New translation of uh, daily. We, we have this question a lot because you will find many places in the Gemara of non-Jewish characters, people, no, quoting people. verses. Um, it's amazing, like qu asking questions on contradictions in verses well, they, they, they in, in Torah. Thing, but, but, but not only God that, not only that, Jews for them. We, have to, we have to remember that the Bible is the most famous work of literature in they history. The Bible, then. Titus what do you mean? Not, they were not Christians. I'm, talk, I'm talking about the, the Hebrew, our Bible. It's called the Tanakh. But, I'm calling no, the, the but, Tanakh. But the, the only reason they learned it is because of Christianity. Okay, well, Christianity was, it was very early. It was, yeah, it's not there yet. It was baby. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, our Hebrew scriptures, the Torah. I understand. This but was a famous not. text, and even the Greeks would study it, and, and, and the Romans learned a lot from the Greeks. Absolutely. And it makes sense with the, the, the aristocratic people, like the Romans, like the, 
the Caesar. the Caesar would know would have heard a thing or two or known a thing or two or opened the book here and there and read this. Because this again, you have to remember, there was only so much literature out there to actually write things, and the Tanakh itself was the most famous. So everybody knew this. You understand? Just like, just like everybody knows have their Facebook today, everyone knew. The, to- the Torah of the, of, the, of the Hebrews. The script, they called it, whatever they called it, they called it their own thing, the Holy Scriptures, the prophets writing, yeah. godly word, the word of God, whatever they called it, they had knowledge of it. It was mainstream, that's my point, of it was mainstream. But, so, but, uh, yeah, I understand the, the, the Caesars and the rulers, I understand. <coughs> because they had the educated the people, yeah. yeah. Anyone, who was, anyone who was educated, this was part of the curriculum. Even nowadays, it's a huge part of the curriculum. Right? Anyway, going further. The payment of four Zuzim that Titus would pay. Uh, did I skip something? No. Nevertheless, he did not pay the Jewish blacksmiths due to his great hatred, hatred of them. Okay, the payment of four Zuzim. Why was it four, we said? That Titus would pay the Gentile blacksmiths was surely a small amount to pay a blacksmith for a day's work, since a blacksmith could, could make upwards of 30 Zuzim per day. Uh huh. Where are you getting that number? That's, I don't know, that's the Ben that's the Yahu's uh, calculation. Okay. He, that's what he understood. Titus specifically paid the Gentile blacksmiths a small amount, since if he paid them for a full day's work, the Jewish blacksmith would see and feel very upset about the Gentile counterpart. Would, uh, uh, he would be very upset that his Gentile counterpart was receiving a full day's payment while the Jew loses out on the entire day which could trigger the Jews to put a curse on Titus. He was scared of that. He didn't want the Jew to curse him. Titus was afraid of this, so he intentionally shortchanged the Gentile blacksmiths, paid them much less, in order to prevent the Jewish blacksmiths from getting jealous, pretty, pretty much, from reacting too negatively and cursing him. Okay, that's how he explains. It's kind of hard. It's very hard to believe. Now we're in the Chatzai Yosef. It's only about two and a quarter pages. Let's see what we have to reveal here. Some deep concepts here I want to explain. Regarding, first, we have to address you know, all the commentaries. Regarding the explanation of the, ben, of the Benayahu, that the reason Titus underpaid the Gentile blacksmith was, was so that the Jewish blacksmiths would not get jealous and put a curse on him, it seems that this answer is deficient, since yes. other, either way, the Jewish blacksmith ends up losing a whole day's of work. He gets paid nothing, which surely seems damaging enough for the Jew to put a curse on Titus anyway. Seeing Titus as the enemy anyway, since he's the enemy that destroyed Jerusalem, I believe the Jews curse him every single day. Sure. Perhaps to defend the position of the Bani Yahu, which we always, to, we always have to try to defend those we disagree with, because that's a big exercise of not only humility, but also of reaching the truth. Perhaps to defend the position of the Bani Yahu, we could say that the satisfaction the Jewish blacksmith received when, saying Titus suffer, uh, when seeing Titus suffer was good enough for him to miss a day's work. I mean, that was his payment for him. That made him happy, uh, the Jew. So long as his Gentile counterpart was getting shortchanged as well, right? Then, then he, the Jew would be able to live with that. But if he saw, if the Jew saw, that the Gentile was getting paid a full day's work, then the sharp contrast between him and the Gentile counterpart of, pay, of payment, you know, full payment versus zero payment, would trigger jealousy in him, leading him to possibly put a curse on Titus. So if we had to def- defend the Benayahu, that's what we would say. Going further now, deeper, let us now adjust the frequency, the frequency uh, contiguous with the deeper understanding of our Gemara. In other words, let's go deeper. Contiguous means... Next the same, yeah. Attached. Yes. Attached. Yes, continuous, basically. Why was it specifically an audio distraction that worked as a remedy for Titus's ailment, his problem? Right? There's a lot of ways to distract somebody. Why was it specifically this, this, this audiological one? Sound. The answer lies in the fundamentals of what sound is altogether. Let's explore this for a second. What is sound? In Torah, there's, there are very different categories of blessings, a few of them. One of which is called birkota nehenin, which means blessings of pleasure. These are blessings that were established by Chazal, by the Chachamim, to be said upon experiencing pleasure from the various creations of Hashem, such as eating food, pleasant scents, aromas, and, uh, and upon the sight of certain remar- remar- remarkable things, such as if you see a rainbow, there's a blessing. 
if you see an elephant as a blessing, or even a particularly gorgeous human being. You know there's a bracha on that, when you see a beautiful person. I don't want to get into that now, because it's going to open up a can of worms, and this whole thing of looking at beautiful people of the opposite, opposite gender, but let's leave that on the side. However, there are no blessings that the Chachamim established to be recited over hearing pleasant sounds, no matter how captivating the singing voice may be, or how elevating the musical notes produced by an instrument may be, no brachot on sound. Now, I have to say, make a side point, there is a bracha on the, hearing the shofar, on Rosh Hashanah, but that's not about a, about a particular beauty, pleasurable thing, it's more of a, a awakening in order to do teshuvah kind of thing. It's not, a partic- it's not like a symphony or something like that. You understand what I'm saying, right? It's not, you wouldn't call it a pleasurable sound. Unlike the smells and the, and the foods, which are pleasurable, you say, brachan. So why not? Why the difference? Because when it comes to sound, the language the Chachamim uses, en bomamash, which means it has no substance. And blessings of pleasure were only established upon things that have substance. They have a physical, what we call mamashut, a something is there. To explain this scientifically, we have to say the following. Sound is produced, we have to know where sound comes from. Sound is produced by the vibration of the medium through which the sound waves travel. But the particles which vibrate to produce sound are already extant, which means they already exist before and after the sound comes to play. In other words, when you hear my voice in this room, it's because my vocal cords are creating vibrations in the air next, or surrounding them, in the air molecules, where air is gas, and gas is mamashut. Gas is substance. It's the lightest, some of the lightest stuff, but it has a mass, it has a weight. Not a weight, weight is, again, I wanna use weight, weight is a misconception. It has a mass, okay, scientifically, it has a mass. And um, the gas, no, gas. Yeah, it's liquid. Gas is a liquid? It, what do you mean? It has it's a medium. Property. It's a medium. It's the same property as a liquid. That's how we study it. Fine. But, I'm, but it's lighter than liquid. You agree yeah, with me? Yeah. Good. Right? And therefore, I mean, and therefore, when you hear the vibration of the sound, it, all the gas particles are following the vibration that were created by my vocal cords. And that, those, those particles. That movement travels in a specific wave function. Everything, by the way, by the way, in the world is wave functions, right? And that reaches your ears, and your ears have very specific apparatuses inside that has to do with fluids and and cilia, which is these little hair cells that catch these vibrations and interpret them and send them to your brain, and then your brain makes the sound. You know, you have the sensation of hearing the sound. Convert. It's an amazing thing. It's just thinking about it blows blows my mind, and it just boggles my mind how anyone could think all this is random. Makes no sense. Anyway. But we came from an amoeba. Sure. Anyway, so that's what a sound is. Or also, that's why you could you could also hear things underwater because that medium could also be water. Water will carry those vibrations of the sound waves, which means the water molecules themselves are moving in this right in this in this wave, uh, and then your ears pick it up, etc. But the point is, no new thing of substance, of mass, is introduced to the system. The only thing is just movement of what's already there. That's what sound is. Movement of what's already there. And you pick up and you pick that up. Okay? No mass is added or subtracted from the system via sound. Whatever medium that was already present simply vibrates to produce it. That is what is meant by en bomamash. It has no substance. All other senses, on the other hand, that we have are sensing something of substance, something that has a mass. For example, the blessings that were said over food, right? That's providing pleasure to the sense of taste. Those blessings are recited upon the physical mass of the food item whose uh, particles interact with the taste receptors on the tongue and throat that make you feel the pleasant taste, right? Those taste receptors are catching physical, solid or liquid food. That's mass, okay? That's... Mamash. Blessings recited over visual sightings, right? Providing uh, pleasure to the sense of sight are recited upon the physical mass of the thing that, you, that is being seen by the visual receptors of the eyes of the seer. 
You understand? Like, that, again, it's on a, you're saying a, bl- a bracha on something physical that has a mass that's a mamashut on the, on the site, whatever's there. Even blessings recited over pleasant scents, right? Smells. Nice smells. There's blood brachot in the brachot. It's you know, all the different besamims. Those things are providing pleasure to the olfactory sense, which means the sense of smell in your nose. Those blessings are recited upon volatile aromatic particles, which means basically gas particles, in the air that are being released from that source of the nice smell that interact with the olfactory receptors as the, at the highest part of the nose, all the way up here, all the way at the top of your nose, the olfactory, olfactory receptors, which, although extremely light, have a mass as well, because they're gas particles. As a side point, I just want to say, smell is said to be in the Gemara a sense that the soul gets benefit and pleasure from. The soul. What do we learn it from? Kola neshama hallelujah. The whole, the entire soul will praise, will praise you, God. Neshama is though that word neshama, soul, is the same word as neshima, which means breath, smell. When you when you take a whiff, taking a breath, right? Inhale, same word, soul and inhale. So and and, and just as a scientific support for that, not that it needs it, but just you know, I like to mention it anyway. We had the pleasure of dissecting the head, human head, okay? And there's something called the cranial nerves, which is the nerves that come directly from the brain out to your face, and one of them goes all the way to your trap over here. Every other nerve in your body goes from, to your spinal cord and then out. These cranial nerves come directly from the brain, right? The one that's closest to the brain, meaning the shortest one, is the olfactory, olfactory one. Olfactory. That's the first. That's actually cranial nerve one, by the way. I don't know why they... That's maybe a, a coincidence. But cranial nerve one, if I can remember correctly, is the olfactory nerve. Just all the way up here. It's a little bulb. It has a little bulb and it's just a straight line to the brain. That's There's it. A little straight line to the brain. Every other nerve is longer. So, yeah. And by the way, just let me turn what I'm saying. And the soul is, of course, said to be in the frontal cortex of the brain. That's where your higher thinking is. And it's right under there. It's literally right... The this is the frontal cortex, and the olfactory uh, nerve goes from the top of your nose straight here, like that. Beautiful stuff, yeah. How, was Hashem, how did Hashem create a human being? How did He create it? In the image of God. No. What was the term? What was the term? Oh, He put the life through the nose. Yeah, that's another point. Right. He, he sent the soul through the nostrils. How was it said, actually? And He blew into His nose. The uh, spirit of life. Yeah. Yes. Uncle famously says there, what did he blow into his nose? The ability to speak. That's what makes you different from everybody else. The ability to speak. Okay. Anyway, that was a side venture. Back over here, talking about sound. Sound is very different from all these other senses by virtue of the fact that it has no mass, no particles that make it up, no physical substance. Instead, the pattern of vibrational movement of the pre-existing particles in the medium is picked up by the marvelously sophisticated vestibulococular system. What that means is the inner ear apparatus. Okay, vestibulococular, yes. The cochlear system. Yeah, vestibulo has to do with your balance. It's also the same place in the inner ear, which has to do with the vibration. Yes. It's, I don't, I'm, getting all these, I'm getting a blast from the past right now of anatomy and learning this. I was just, I don't understand how atheists can exist. They just learn about how the ear works. It's 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 phenomenal. It's like unbelievable. Uh, this little like thing like this, this little box like this, and you it allows you to hear sounds, and it keeps you from falling on your face f- flat and back. Keeps your balance all day. You ever have uh, vertigo? It takes someone to get vertigo to really appreciate what God does for you every second of your life, keeping your balance through this little system. It's unbelievable. Okay. Then the nerve impulses get sent to the brain, then that's how you can hear. Okay. In this way, sound is arguably the most spiritual senses of them all, all uh, along with the smell, uh, uh, the sense of smell, like we said. Good. Right. I bring us, uh, in note three in the bottom, I bring a verse. It says in the Yov, uh, from my flesh I see God. Plain and simple. From, I don't see any, I don't need any of the proofs. From my own human flesh, how this thing amazingly functions, 
from God. Okay, I see God. You guys uh, want to keep going? Keep going. Or? You want to keep going? You're good? You're... I'm okay. Keep All right. Going. Danny, you okay? All right. Now, with this understood, it becomes apparent why it was sound that remedied Titus' pain. I want to at least just finish this uh, paragraph. One of the major complaints the Romans had against the Jews was that it was difficult for the Romans to accept the Jews' theology of serving an invisible God that had no physical form, right? The, the Romans worshipped a bunch of pagan gods which they made statues out of in temples which they saw and felt and touched. They didn't understand how the Jews worshipped an invisible God. The Romans, as well as the rest of the world at the time, were idolaters, idolaters, pagans. As such, they deemed it essential that any deity must have been able to be depicted in some fashion. If you could not visualize it, then it must be a hoax. Their culture was so enthralled with the physical, we like that word too, that even their spiritual aspirations were littered with depictions and visual representations of their deities, which is utterly taboo in Jewish theology, right? We are allergic to images of God. As we mentioned before, we do not see, I'm sorry, we do see that Titus gives some credence to Hashem's power, since he admits that Hashem is the one controlling the sea, the sea storm, right? In the previous section, he said, this must be the God of the Jews bringing the sea storm. So he's acknowledging something that God has some power, the Jewish God. Even though he can't see it. Right. Nevertheless, Titus greatly devalued Hashem as well, since he challenged to fight him on dry land. It seems a strong... Uh, it seems a strong contribution to the reason Titus acted so brazenly was the notion that the God of the Jews was a God with no physical form. That's why he felt a little, you know, uh, pompous over him. Titus found the God of the Jews to be insignificant in this sense, as if he were a God with no substance, no mamashut, en bo mamash, the God of the Jews, en bo mamash. Right? Thus, chas of course. Thus, to dispel this notion that non-physical things are powerless, right? That's what Titus was thinking. To dispel that notion, Hashem ordained that it would be precisely a sound. Something that also in Bumamash has no mass, <coughs> no substance. That's very interesting. That provided relief for Titus' suffering. Proving to Titus that non-physical things can actually be the most powerful sometimes. Isn't that deep? Heaven, aren't you glad you came today? Heaven ordained that it, that it be the sound of a banging hammer that comforted him rather than any other sound, a banging hammer. Why? Because a blacksmith strikes the hammer into, oh man, I should say into, you see that? Unto, actually un, unto works here as well. Read that the next word. The blacksmith strikes the hammer unto unshaped, yes, upon, basically. Yeah. Unshaped metal slabs, right? He's hitting these metal slabs. Forcibly forging the metal into the desired shape, depending on what he's making, a sword, whatever it is, in which it will be able to form, to perform its intended function. In the same way, heaven was striking Titus with afflictions in order to subjugate and mold his ego towards the intended function of humankind, which is honoring Hashem. We could stop there, there if you guys want, and we can finish this next week. It's ten forty. What do you say? Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.